founders of building internet-related companies all over the world. He was named Technology Pioneer by the World Economic Forum. He's rung the Wall Street bell. He's led companies with thousands of staff. Welcome, Johan Stahl von Holstein. Wow, thank you so much. I think it's amazing to be here. And I will tell you a story about why I think it's amazing and why, and why I'm here. But I'm, So I have to start with a, telling you about the history, the background, and then I'll tell you a bit about the present, and then I'm gonna tell you a bit about the future. I come from a very, I come from a farm in the middle of nowhere, outside a very small, unimportant village, outside a small town, which nobody's ever heard of, and I was very dyslexic, so I don't read and write very well. <clears throat> I was hyper energetic, which is the reason I still walk back and forth on a scene while I speak. And I was actually very lousy at school. And when I finished my, um, my ninth grade, I, was, I, was, I started selling when I was six. My, my grandfather was a fisherman, so the first thing I sold was fish. And then I went, I was a soccer fan, so I sold sweets on the soccer games when I was 12. And I sold newspapers. And at 14, I started working in a cheese factory. So I was a real farmer's boy. And at the age of 15, 16, when I finished my um, gymna uh, gymnasium, the, pre um, the school principal said, well, he doesn't need to continue school. He can take a full-on job at the factory. And my mother, she refused to accept that. She said, my son is talented. He's smart. He's going to study. And she forced me to study languages. And since I can't read and write, I can think, well, that was might not so smart. But I do speak Spanish, French, German, English, and Swedish now. So I'm kind of happy that she did. But I was still very bad at school. So I traveled around the world for years and just hitchhiked around, working as a waiter, working as a rep, as a ski teacher, and doing things I really like to do. Until I had a really severe car accident. And I spent three months in hospital. And coming out of there, I realized that, well, I probably needed to get some kind of education. So I went into university, which was very difficult for somebody who's got the difficulties of reading and writing as I do. So what did I have to do? I had to work harder than everybody else. And I struggled getting out of there. And then I taught myself how to think in pictures instead of words and letters, and which made me eventually actually finish off my degrees with very good degrees, but not because I was talented, but because I worked harder. And once I finished, I got a job for one of the most amazing entrepreneurs Sweden's ever had. He's not so famous outside Sweden as he is within Sweden, but he is fundamental to where Sweden is today because he broke down what Sweden's history and past was, not believing in oneself, believing in the community, believing in that society would take care of you, he challenged that and said, you can do it yourself. And I managed to get a job for him. I actually met him in Barcelona, which we left yesterday. And I had studied for four years. I was indebted up over my ears with student loans. And the first job, I come into a suit like this, and he says, no, 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 no. You have to have jeans and a T-shirt, and a T-shirt should be dirty. You need to look cheap. And I said, why? I'm an MBA. I've studied at Harvard. I've worked so hard for this. And he said, no, everybody who starts working for me has to start with carrying a beer. And if you're good at carrying a beer, you can start off as president for any company you want. And, you know, I figured this is so unfair. I was ambitious. I was hardworking. I had worked so hard to get where I was. And I had a friend who I was studying with who was five, six years younger than me because I was old when I started studying. And he was actually quite bad at school, but he knew, his father knew the, the guy that I was working for, and he got a job in the you know, main office with a nice suit, and I had to start at the very bottom, and I figured, this is not fair. And you know what? Life's not fair. And we should be very, very happy that life's not fair. Because if it was fair, we would probably have been bored because there's 70 billion people in the history of mankind. So we would have been bored maybe thousands or hundreds of years ago when people died in toothache at the age of 13. And where we, we've, we've all been born at the end of the 1900s. It doesn't matter where we're born. We've been born in the best area of all times. Just this is winning on the lottery. Actually, the fact that we exist is winning on a lottery considering the amount of sperms and in the inoculation. We are all winners from day one, regardless 
of where we're born, what color we have, what intelligence we have. We exist and we have the ability to do something with our lives. So I sat down and I said, life's not fair. Like Bill Gates said, love is not fair, get used to it. And I figured, how am I going to win? How am I going to win from this beer carrying job that I had was creating a chain of shops for TV shops products, shit products that didn't work. And I figured, I'm going to work two hours harder than everybody else. Because if I work two hours harder, nobody's two hours smarter than me a day. So I went in first of everybody in the office in the morning. And at the end of the evening, when the last guy went home, I put on my clock and I stayed for another two hours. And after a couple of months, I finished the project one month earlier than he had anticipated. And I then started working on a business plan for a TV channel. He came back from a trip. I gave him the business plan. He made me marketing director for the TV channel. The TV channel had, nobody knew of the TV channel. They didn't really know, didn't have an audience. So I designed the marketing strategy for the channel and took it from 6 7% penetrations to over 90% in six months. So you, he calls me up and says, you're doing a fantastic job. And I'm not going to make you precedent for your first time. It's nine months out of university, I was CEO for my first company. And I went, yeah! And he said, what am I going to do? He said, teletext. You know teletext? Probably the most boring medium ever invented by man. And I tried to get out of it. So I said, well, John, you know, John, well, his name was John Steinbeck. And I said, John, you know, I'm a technical idiot. My father's told me so since I was 12 years old and took apart a bicycle, never got it together again. And John says one of the most important things anybody's ever said to me in my entire life. He says, Johan... Any idiot can learn anything in three months. That was revolutionizing to me. Because suddenly I understood that the difference between a super smart MBA from MIT and somebody who's a farmer's boy who's dyslexic and a cheese turner is about this big. It is absolutely nothing. And I realized that this was so magnificent to me that I realized that suddenly everybody can do anything they want if they just put their mind into it. If they just put the three months and decide that they're going to be able to be successful. So I took the job as CEO. And in six months, I built the largest teletext production company in the world with offices in eight, nine countries. He calls me up <coughs> and he says, this is amazing. You're fantastic. You're now executive vice president for Bank I own in Luxembourg. So I go into the bank, and I was there for two years, living together with him, and I took my salary <coughs> from $2,000 a month when I started, which is still fairly good, but for an MBA with a lot of student loans, it wasn't that good. Five years later, I had um, $35,000 a month. I had a convertible sports car. I lived together with John Stemek in his house, and thank you very much, sir. And I thought I was ridiculously wealthy and successful. And one night we were standing in our underpants drinking whiskey after having been out partying. And I, I say to him, how much money do you need to be rich? Because I felt very, very rich. I had about a million dollars already in unlisted stock in his companies. And he says, wow, Johan, you probably need 50 million. 50 million dollars, I said. What on earth would you want $50 million for? And he said, well, you know, you want a farm, you want an apartment in New York, an apartment in Stockholm, and a summer house in Saint-Tropez, and something in the Alps. You need a boat and staff on the boat, sports car arts on the walls, jewelry on your wife and your kids in the right school. It goes fast. <laughs> I had never in my life thought about value of that size. I've never thought about so money, so much money. I thought that was impossible to reach. And what do we know about impossible? It's nothing. So I walk up to him and I say, well, John, I want to have $50 million. And he says, well, Johan, stay with me for 10 years. I promise you $50 million. <coughs> now, the thing is, it was not a charity organization, which meant that if I was going to make $50 million working for him, I'd probably need to make $200 million for him. And if he thought I was good enough to make $250 million, 
I didn't need to work any for anybody, so I resigned. And I put up the goal for myself, I needed to make $50 million. Not because I really needed $50 million, just because I needed to prove that I could, that I made the right decision. And I needed to make $50 million in half the time. So in January of 1996, as one of the first internet entrepreneurs and pioneers of Europe, together with some friends, I started a company called Icon Media Lab. In five years, we grew it from zero to 3,500 employees, 32 offices in 26 countries. We put it public first on the stock exchange in Sweden, secondly on the stock exchange in New York, and I actually opened live in CNN, the New York Stock Exchange. I started the first sharing economy company in the world called Let's Buy It.com, which was about the first company that tried to gather a crowd and make value out of it by saying, if we all want to buy a Volvo car, we can get a much better price than if we go one by one. And that was in 1998. And by the year 2000, I had built companies um, valued, <coughs> I don't know how you're going to calculate, at about five, no, let me see here. Um, yes, about five, six billion US dollars. And my personal wealth was about $600 million. I had beaten the crap out of my friend who started out in his nice suit at the right office. And how did I do that? By working two hours more a day. Not one, but two. And to be honest, maybe sometimes until eight, until faint. Eight until faint, I love that expression. Um, because if you work harder, Nobody is more than this much smarter than you, and if you work this much more, that makes everybody into a winner. Anybody can do anything they want and achieve anything. Impossible is? Yes. And we can do this. And I think, so, you know, it was an incredible experience for me to build these things. Now the internet bubble went like, th it went like this, and then it crashed, and I lost everything, almost everything. Did that matter? No, because you know what? You get one chance, two chances, three chances, and eventually, for the person who's persistent and who works hard, never give ups, never give up. That's lesson number one of the world. And if you don't give up, if you work hard and you put your money, your, 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 your energy into it, your passion into it, you're, you commit to something you want to do, nothing is impossible. So... I was, during this time, one of the very first visionaries of the internet. I loved the internet because I saw that it would build systems that would actually break down um, monopolies. It would break down unnecessary middlemen. It would put the power into the hands of mankind. And I saw internet go from where it was, nobody heard of it in 1996, to be in everything. I knew that it was going to be in the cellular phones. I knew that we were going to download movies over the... I just saw this, visualized it in front of me. Because if you can visualize it, it's true. Pablo Picasso said that, the best artist in the history of mankind. He said, if you can see it, if you can visualize it, if you can see the 10,000 people in the football stadium, it's true. You can do it, but you need to visualize it. You need to understand. You have to set your goals. Tell, know what you want. See where you want to go. And then just do it the Nike way. So, where was I? I lost track. Yes, so I saw where the internet was going. And I said, eventually, <coughs> the internet is going to empower man. It's going to make us all be able to capitalize on our networks, on the digital values that we have. And I was dreaded to see what Google did by stealing our digital identity, identities, by creating... Um, <coughs> um, creating um, profiles that they would sell and exploit. And then Facebook came along. And, and when they, Facebook came, and Google came out and said, um, hold on, oh, and said that, make no evil. I said, that's funny, coming from the most evil company in the history of mankind. Yeah. And when Facebook came along, I said, now Google has somebody that's even more evil than them. And I said that Facebook is going to become the most valuable company in the world. Why? Because they're stealing all the knowledge and experience and values that we have as individuals. They're stealing a most important thing, our networks. And they're building their profits and they're making billions and billions out of the money and the values that's ours, that we should have. So, 
Um, I predicted what we call today influencer marketing, the ability and the values of actually being able to profit on the networks that we have and the brands that we can build for ourselves and the hard work that we're putting in to building this knowledge and experience and brand and networks. And, <coughs> hold on. Sorry. And um, so I st tried to start a company called MyCube in 2009. Same year that Bitcoin was released. And I created a cryptocurrency called uh, Coins. Cubes, sorry, Cubes. Um, I bought a thousand Bitcoins, which I lost in two weeks um, because it was too complicated. I wish I could find them, uh, <laughs> uh, but I can't. But, um, and the idea with my cube was that everybody should own their own digital identity in order to be able to exploit that and leverage on the network and knowledge that they had and the values that we could put into the digital environment. The company, for a number of different reasons, failed. Sometimes you don't succeed, but what do you do then? You never give up. So um, I've been working on another number of things, and I've known Jonas for 10, 15 years. And Jonas has presented me to different network things. And I love the idea of networking and not network marketing. But I've never really felt that the ideas were good enough or quite there. Until he phones me up in, in April, May and says, Johan, this time, this time we're doing everything right. We have 15, 20 years of experience. We've built on the platform and we know the right thing. We're going to sell digital products. And I looked at Crowd1 and I saw, my God, this has the potential of changing everything. It is giving back the ability to leverage on your networks, selling digital products to your friends and family or people in your vicinity. If everybody, if anybody works hard on this, we can bring trade to people. I believe very strongly in the gig economy. The gig economy meaning basically that as digitalization increases in every industry all over the world, as people will be and companies will be more and more digitalized, things will change faster and faster. Things will grow faster and faster. And as that happens, nobody is going to work in a company and get a gold watch. Companies won't exist for that long. The chances are that you'll have to change jobs every five, six, seven years or every three months. And competition is going to be so hard because there's so many people that you might not even make enough money on a full-time job. You will have to do things on the side. You'll have to have ways of leveraging on your abilities. You'll have to have abilities to make money on the two extra hours you put in. And because of that, I believe that you know a company that can give people the ability to find trading opportunities, to sell things and make money on the side, that is of immense importance. My mentor, Jan Steenbeck, he told me that there is nothing as valuable as a good salesperson. You can have a lousy shit company with shit products and great salespeople and you will thrive. You can have fantastic products in a great company and lousy salespeople and a company will go bankrupt. A good salesperson is worth their weight in gold. And nothing is as pathetic as a salesperson who does not sell. Crowd1 is not a charity project. It's not going to make everybody successful. But if you commit, if you work hard, we are going to bring trade to Africa. Where others be, will be, come with charity money. We say, no, make business. We're going to be able to build, find companies and products that wouldn't have reached Africa without us. And we're going to be able to make people find jobs and ability to take personal responsibility for their own future. And this excites me immensely. Because if we do this right, this will be the last network you ever join. <clears throat> this is going to be the network that goes on for 20 years. We are going to get... Because the, the beauty is... How many of you here are on social media? Hand up. How many of you have more than 500 people in your networks? Almost everybody. If we can reach 10 million people connected in Crowd1 
and they all have more than five, um, 500 people in their network. It means we reach five billion people. That's almost everybody in the world that's on social media or networks, digital networks. It means not only that we will change the lives of the people selling at Crowd1, but we will change the world through the way that entrepreneurs with good products does not have to go to the banks, to the venture capitalists, or whoever else like or do not like their product and play God. But we'll take good products to the people with a profit for the companies and for the salespeople in Crowd1. We will change the world. And we are so committed. I, have, I came into this, I was skeptical. Because, you know, there is a bad reputation in the MLM marketing. <clears throat> well, we're not an MLM marketing company. This, I was skeptical because, you know, there's so, many, there's so much risk if people don't do this right. I look at the people and the talent and the programmers and the security people and the passion and commitment that Jonas puts in and the talent of the salespeople that I have met and the long-term ambitions and the good... Hearted. I talked to Mr. Botswana, who says we're taking poverty, people out of poverty. We're bringing trade to Africa. And I feel if we do this right, if we commit, if we work hard, impossible is... Good. I'm a very, very emotional guy. And uh, I just, I really, really feel so emotionally attached to the potential in this. And if we commit that we work together, because what I also like here is that people work together. It's not just about me and my down to line it. It's about actually making something. We need to get to critical mass. We need to get enough people into this industry to really go out there and make an impact. And we will, we will be devastating to VC companies, to the banking system. We are putting digital money and cash into the hands of people who are not even bankable in some countries. So, thank you all very much. I'm going to work very hard to make this my third unicorn. I have the ambitions to one day put this public on a major stock exchange. And let's, let's kick some ass. Thank you all.